Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wassalamu ala rasulillah. Alhamdulillahi hamdan yuwafi ni'amahu wa yukafi'u mazidah wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma alimna ma anfa'una wa anfa'na bima alamtana wa zidna ilman. Ya kareem. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, in Surah Al-Kahf, which most of us would have read yesterday, in the very final verse of the surah, this verse in the surah highlights and draws the blueprint of how we should be treating Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It's the very blueprint of our interactions with Rasulullah. Are we supposed to elevate Rasulullah, and what degree are we supposed to elevate Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam to? And I'm going to start off with these verses or this verse particularly because of how important the whole concept of our interactions with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is in this blessed surah al-hujurat so before i even get into the surah i want to take a look at this verse allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says qul inma ana basharun mithlukum yuha ilayya annama ilahukum ilahu wahid faman kana yarju liqa'a rabbih falyamal 'amalan saliha wa la yushrik bi 'ibadati rabbih ahada Allah is telling the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he's saying say o Muhammad inna ma ana basharun mithlukum i'm no more than a human being like yourself all of the people that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi is addressing he's saying say to them that i'm no more than a human being but hold on hang on a lot of people stop when they're reciting this verse and they're trying to establish the humanity or the humane nature of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam what do they do they say Allah's Prophet ﷺ was told to, told to say, "Inna ma ana bashar mithlukum." I'm no more than a human being. But hold on, there's a clause. What's the clause? Allah continued and told him. He said, "Yuha ilay." I have revelation coming to me. That's the difference between normal human beings and Rasulullah. So there is a clause to that. If he was just a mere human being, would we have all these particular set of rulings for the Prophet ﷺ? If we hear something of him. We're not allowed to reject it. If we hear his name, we say "Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam." Why are all those things there? They're there because Yuha Ilai. He's saying, "I have revelation coming to me." That's the difference. But hold on, again, there's another clause. When the revelation comes into the pictures, picture, what did the Nasara do? What did the Christians do? As soon as the revelation came into the picture, they said that Jesus is God. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew the nature of man. He first, uh, he first told all of humanity, or told the Prophet ﷺ to tell all of humanity that this is my station. إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ I'm no more than a human being. But hang on, you have to elevate me as well. There is some degree of elevation that you have to do for me as well. And that is, يُحَا إِلَيْ I have revelation coming to me. But when revelation comes into the picture, as we saw that... The Jews, not all of them, some of them said, said Uzairun ibn Allah, that Uzair is the son of Allah. Others said what? They didn't say that. But Christians, they said that about Jesus, Isa ibn Allah. So Allah is now telling the Prophet ﷺ to remind the people, though I am elevated in status, yuha ilayhi, what's that revelation? Annama ilahukum ilahu wahid. That the God the revelation because of which I was elevated is that your God is only one God. So you elevate me, but don't take me to the status of uluhiya. Don't take me to the status of servitude towards God. That is so clearly highlighted in these verse, verses. And then to make further clauses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُوا لِقَاءَ رَبِّهِ Whoever wishes the meeting of his Lord, then let him do good deeds and let him not associate in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A poet said, no matter how questionable his poetry can be, besides these lines, he said, Leave that which the Christians had proclaimed for their Prophet. Besides that, Besides that, say everything you want about the Prophet Wahtakimi, And make it very, very clear that you're willing to say this. And whatever else you want to say about the Prophet ﷺ, go ahead so long as you don't take him to the level that leads him now to lordship. That's 
the way we interact with Rasulullah. We don't consider him just a mere human being because Allah didn't consider him just a mere human being. He considered him a mere human being, but at the same time he said, revelation comes to you. وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ when, he's, when the whole, when, the, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is discussing the status of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in verses which are unequivocal. What does unequivocal mean? That they cannot have another translation. He's mentioning you to the status of Rasulullah. He says, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ That Muhammad is no more than, but he reminds you, he doesn't tell you now Bashar, he says, Rasul, he's a messenger, so watch out. Yes, he's a human being, but he still has a status of a messenger. So there's something that is there for the Prophet ﷺ in this regard. And of course, we look at the lines that Hassan ibn Thabit, he used to say, about the Prophet ﷺ, he used to say, وَأَحْسَنُ مِنْكَ لَمْ تَرَقَطُّ عَيْنِي وَأَجْمَلُ مِنْكَ لَمْ تَلِدِ النِّسَاءُ خُلِقْتَ مُبَرَّأً مِنْ كُلِّ عَيْبٍ كَأَنَّكَ قَدْ خُلِقْتَ كَمَا تَشَاءُ That more beautiful than you and better than you, O Prophet of Allah, he's saying this to the Prophet ﷺ to his face now. He's saying more beautiful and more beloved and more, you know, greater in looks than you, my eyes have never seen. And more beautiful and in perfection, women have never bore. Given birth to. وَأَجْمَلُ مِنْكَ لَمْ تَلِدِ النِّسَاءُ خُلِقْتَ مُبَرَّأً And of course, all of a sudden, if you really, really, if you really, really look deeply, you're actually going to think that maybe he's doing shit, but he's not. Because he was permitted to praise the Prophet ﷺ to that degree. So long as again, the praise doesn't reach to the level where, where we are taking the Prophet ﷺ beyond the status of a mere Prophet to now a Lord. And it's as if you've been created. But remember, he said created. That's what keeps him a human being. You've been created free of all problems. It's as if you, O Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, were created as you pleased yourself. Can you imagine? If one of us was to say something like this, a lot of us would say to one another, hey, hey, hold on, hold on. Don't go too far. That's extremism. Those attributes are for Allah Azza wa But as I said, so long as we distinguish, make a draw a line between the attributes of Allah, who's creating? Allah is creating. Khuliqta, you've been created. But when you were created, you were created free of all faults. So so long as we draw that line, it's not a problem. Now that we have that in our minds, let's look at what station Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in these verses of Surah Al-Hujurat. Surah Al-Hujurat is just an amazing surah. I'm going to calm down a bit. I was giving you a lot of information. A lot of people were like, what? What are you saying? But I'm going to calm down a bit now. Surah Al-Hujurat is an amazing surah. It's a surah that is directed to our hearts, every single one of us. It's a surah that's meant for believers. It's a surah that is written or it is a surah which is gift from which is a gift from Allah Azza wa Jal to every single one of us. Why do I say this? I say this because if you look through Surah Al Hujurat again and again, does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make an address to the believers. So it's almost like a believer specific surah. Once in the surah does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make an address to all of humanity. So since it's such a believer specific surah, every single one of us has to listen very very carefully. And beyond that, Surah Al-Hujurat is the beginning of the end of the Qur'an. How so? We know the Qur'an is divided into different hizab, right? So the last hizb or the portion of the Qur'an is known as Hizb al-Mufassal. In one of two opinions of the scholars, Hizb al-Mufassal starts from Surah Al-Hujurat. In one of two opinions of the scholars, Hizb al-Mufassal starts from Surah Al-Hujurat. So, Hizb al-Mufassal being the last portion of the Qur'an, this is the beginning of the end of the Qur'an. And since it's the beginning of the end of the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put a lot of information in this surah. And it's very, very important for all of us and societies at large to learn and understand this surah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes His very first address. He says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا O who you believe, لَا تُقَدِّمُوا do not put forward 
بَيْنَ يَدَيِ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ Before Allah and His Messenger. Do not put anything forward before Allah and His Messenger. وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ And fear Allah Azza wa Jal. إِنَّ اللَّهَ سَمِيعٌ عَلِيمٌ Verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all hearing and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all knowing. You'd notice that Allah is telling you do not put anything forward before who? Allah and His Messenger. So the very first ayah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to teach us starts off with is Allah and His Messenger. You'd notice that there's a lot of ahkam in the surah. There, Allah is not just going to tell you don't put anything before Allah and His Messenger. He's going to tell you a lot of things in the surah. But the very first ruling that he puts so that you learn from the manner in which Allah is putting together the Qur'an. That since I'm telling you not to put anything forward before Allah and His Messenger, the first ayah and the first ruling and the first manner, and that's why the surah is also known as Surah Al-Adab, the surah of different manners. The first manner that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning here is don't put anything before Allah and His Messenger so He doesn't put anything before Allah and His Messenger. The first verse is related to Allah and His Messenger. And every time you hear the word, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Oh who you believe. You have to pay a lot of attention. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu used to say that every single time, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا comes into a picture, then say, فَأَرْعِيَا سَمَنْ Then start listening very very carefully to it. Why? Because it's going to be either something good that you're commanded with, or it's either something bad that you're going to be forbidden from. Over here what's happening? لا تقدمي Something bad. Don't put anything before Allah and His Messenger. You'd notice, a lot of us are probably in a lot of confusion. Don't put anything before Allah and His Messenger. Don't put what before Allah and His Messenger. Actually, there's no mention even of anything. That's me translating the verse. Allah says, do not put before Allah and His Messenger. Do not put what before Allah and His Messenger. Don't put your opinions. Don't put your concerns. Don't put, what, what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala referring to? Yes? Don't put other people. Every single understanding that could be legitimate is, under, is, is meant over here. Don't put any speech before Allah and His Messenger. Don't put anything, period, before Allah and His Messenger. Oftentimes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala omits a portion of the sentence. That is to cause generality in the sentence. So Allah didn't mention not to, you know, what is it that a man is not supposed to put before. He didn't mention the object that is being discussed. That is to imply generality. Anything that comes to your mind that you can possibly put before Allah and His Messenger, don't do it. So it's as if placement of something before is what is being addressed. And not placement of something before another thing. You know what I'm trying to say? As in, the placing before is what is being said. Allah is telling you not to place before. That is what's being talked about. Not to place before. And He's not saying don't place this before that. So when it comes to the Messenger of Allah, anything that comes to your mind. When it comes to the Prophet ﷺ and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, anything that comes to your mind which you can place before him, don't do it. The Prophet ﷺ, he said in a hadith, that none of you is a true believer. حَتَّى يَكُونَ هَوَاهُ تَبَعًا لِمَا جِئْتُ بِهِ That none of you is a true believer until his desires become part and parcel of what I had brought to him. They become followers, his desires become followers of what I have brought. And that is the Qur'an and Sunnah. So every single thing you can think of that you can possibly place before Rasulullah, you have to, you have to place it behind Rasulullah. Everything that you can think of, you can, that you can place before the message of Allah Azza wa Jal, you have to put it back. When it comes to your mind, when it comes, a lot of times you know, somebody tells this a hadith, yeah, it's a hadith, okay. But Fulan said, that scholar said, and this scholar said, and that scholar said, you have to put it behind. Everything goes behind. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is in the picture, stay quiet. Hadith. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it says in the Qur'an, okay. If it's unequivocal, of course, a lot of times, passages in the Qur'an, you have to understand that as well. That's why there's scholarly debates on issues. 
A scholar that is known for his piety wouldn't be so stubborn and arrogant for him to reject, reject the sunnah of Rasulullah so, so No scholar in his right mind would do something like this. Questions afterwards. Okay? No scholar in his right mind would do something like this. So, there is some room for debate and that is whenever the passages of the Qur'an and sunnah are not unequivocal. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا تُقَدِّمُوا بَيْنَ يَدَيِ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ سَمِيعٌ عليم. And what happens a lot of times to people is that when you tell them to fear Allah, they start to have a problem, and that is arrogance. And subhanAllah, arrogance is something that you have to cleanse your heart from. You have to do it. It was a trait of Satan. If you want to have a satanic trait in your heart, go ahead and keep it in your heart. It's a satanic trait. The reason why Satan disbelieved in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the message, though he knows there's a Lord, though he knows there's a God, all of those things are there. It was that arrogance. So arrogance needs to be taken out of the heart. Every single one of us has some faults. Isn't that so? رَفَعْنَا بَعْضَكُمْ فَوْقَ بَعْضٍ دَرَجَاتٍ Every single one of us was raised over another in some things or another. So the scholars, they said based on this verse, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised some people over others. He said every single person is raised and every single person is lower. But you have to look at which regards that he's lower in, which regards he's raised in. A person has a nice trait, he gives a lot of sadaqah. Maybe that other person that prays night prayer, he can't give sadaqah. So you can't be arrogant and say, okay, I pray night prayer, but you, you know, you're not doing that. Because you're raised, yeah, in that regard, but he's raised in a lot of regards as well. If a person doesn't have money, but he has deen. I mean, what I mean to say is, if a person doesn't have money that he can give, but at the same time he has deen as in he's fasting, or something of that sort. He's raised in one regard as well. So when you're about to put your sadaqah into the mosque, don't have in your heart, yeah, look, I'm a, you know, I've got the money, so I can just toss whatever I want, wherever I want. And it's sadaqah, and I'm getting reward for it. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, that is the grace of Allah, He gives it to whoever He wills. When the masakeen came to the Prophet ﷺ, and they argued with him. They said, you know, the people of money, they got all the ajr. The Prophet ﷺ said, don't you have something to give sadaqah with as well? And he gave them all these ways they can give sadaqah, even, though if, they, even if they don't have money. At the end of it, they, the other people, rich people also found out that they have other means of giving sadaqah. So they started practicing those as well. The poor people came back to the Prophet ﷺ and they started complaining again. So what did the Prophet ﷺ said? He said, this is the grace of Allah, I can't do anything about it. So when you're about to give that money, don't say, yeah, Allah has given me the grace. Yeah, Allah has given you, what? Fadlam min Allah. We we'll learn in the later part in the surah, that that which He has given you is what? Fadlam min Allah. It is grace from Allah. And what does that mean? That means you have nothing to do with it. So how can you be arrogant? You can't even repay him. And that's why the word fadl means something you can't repay somebody for. Li fadlun alayhi. I have a virtue over him. I have grace over him in a manner that he can't even repay me back anymore. There's something called adil. If we get in a fight and you break my tooth and we take it to the Islamic court, they'll break your tooth. That's called adil. But if I say, no, no, no. It was an accident, akhi. I know you didn't mean to do it. Can you repay me? Can you replace that teeth for me? You can't do it, right? That's what's called fadl. So what you have is fadl and nothing more than that. It's grace from Allah which you can never repay Him for. So when somebody comes to a person and they say, Ittaqillah, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, every single one of us is in need of a reminder. So we are not supposed to be arrogant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He even told the Prophet to fear Allah. Can you believe that? The Prophet ﷺ, who's much greater than us, he has all... Well, of course, nobody has any reason to be arrogant, but if anybody really had a justifiable reason, it would probably be more so the Prophet than us, right? But even then, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to him, Ya ayyuhal nabi, ittaqillah. O Messenger, fear Allah. O Prophet, fear Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said it again in another verse in the same surah. O Messenger, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the first message and the first adab that this surah is calling us to, it's calling us to what? 
It's calling us to not place anything before Allah and His Messenger. وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيَرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِ It's not for a believer, a believing man, nor for a believing woman. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made a decision or His Prophet has made a decision, that He has any choice to it. You don't have a choice. If Allah and His Messenger had said something and decreed it and finalized it and legislated, that's it. Ya أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا After Allah brings Himself up to make us realize again, yes, the Prophet ﷺ has his status, but Allah's status is even before the Prophet ﷺ. And the only reason why the Prophet ﷺ ended up having such a status was because of his interaction with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, i.e. he gets wahi. Yuha ilay. He gets revelation from Allah Azza wa That's the mere reason why the Prophet ﷺ ended up having the status, right? So after he establishes first and foremost Allah's own status, then he starts talking about the Prophet ﷺ alone in more detail. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, o who you believe, la tarfa'u aswatakum fawqa sawt nabi Don't raise your voices over the voice of the Prophet ﷺ. وَلَا تَجْهَرُوا لَهُ بِالْقَوْلِ And don't be so explicit. And don't be so loud when you're coming and speaking to him. Why not? أَن تَحْبَطَ أَعْمَالُكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَشْعُرُونَ Lest your deeds will become wasted and you will not even notice it. Your deeds will end up becoming wasted. All of that because you raised the voice, your voice before the Messenger of Allah Azza wa and that has two different meanings. Number one, it has a literal meaning, and that is when you're before the Prophet ﷺ, literally you're in the gathering of Rasulullah ﷺ. And this was because the Prophet ﷺ used to hear some people and they were very loud. And the Prophet ﷺ is very shy. He's very, very shy. He was very shy ﷺ. To a degree that the Prophet ﷺ, Jullu Nadarihi Al Mulahada. Most of what he would do in terms of looking at people would be from the corner of his eyes. He couldn't. Look at people eye to eye because of how shy he was. Mulahada, what does that mean? This is called a lahab. This corner of your eye is called a lahab. Alright? So, mulahada means when you look from the corner of your eye. It doesn't mean to notice something. That is a meaning that's modernly used, you know, in modern standard Arabic. But classically, mulahada would mean that looking from the corner of your eye. So, the Prophet ﷺ, most of the time when he would look, he would look from the corner of his eye because he couldn't, out of his shyness and his humbleness, he wasn't able to look at people face to face. So, he wouldn't be able to tell people, stay quiet. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He told people to stay quiet for Him. When you're with the Prophet ﷺ, don't raise your voices above the voice of the Prophet ﷺ. Also, he wasn't, he wasn't very loud, he wouldn't speak very loud. Except when he would be giving a khutbah. When the Prophet ﷺ would be giving a khutbah, like khutbah Jum'ah, he would be giving it as if he's commanding an army. It would be very, very loud. And it would shake people. But when he would be talking in regular day-to-day -day conversations, it wasn't a very loud voice. So the Sahaba were told to keep their voices lower than the, the volume of Rasulullah Why? So they don't sound like they're greater in status than them. Because what happens is, when you have a very, very nice person, even if he's very, you know, even if he's very great, elevated, person of stat stature and status, when he's very nice to people, what happens? People start trampling all over him. They start acting mean back to him. Right? إِذَا أَنْتَ أَكْرَمْتَ الْكَرِيمَ مَلَكْتَهُ وَإِنْ أَنْتَ أَكْرَمْتَ إِذَا أَنْتَ أَكْرَمْتَ الْكَرِيمَ مَلَكْتَهُ Whenever you're nice to a person who's nice back to you, he'll be, he'll be you know, grateful of you. وَإِنْ أَنْتَ أَكْرَمْتَ اللَّئِيمَةَ مَرَّدًا And if you're nice to a person who's not so nice, what's he gonna do? He's gonna try to take advantage of you. That's what he'll do. So the Prophet ﷺ, out of his niceness, there was 100,000 people around the Prophet ﷺ on the day of Hajj. He was very nice. So at times there would be that odd Bedouin or something like that, that would come and he wouldn't be treating the Prophet ﷺ the way the Prophet ﷺ should have been treated. But the Prophet ﷺ would overlook it anyways. He would never be you know, mean to anybody. He would never, the Prophet ﷺ never sought revenge for anything that was done against his own soul. If it was for against Allah and his deen, then he would take revenge. 
For his own soul, even if people spat at him, which they did, even if people throw stuff at him, rocks at him, until the point that he started bleeding, the Prophet ﷺ didn't take revenge. If it was about Allah and his deen, then the Prophet ﷺ only would take revenge. So, because of his shyness and the way he would treat his Sahaba, his companion, Allah had to intervene and t- teach the Sahaba how to treat the Prophet ﷺ. So from this point onwards, Abu Bakr, he said, I used to speak to the Prophet ﷺ, he actually told the Prophet ﷺ, from today onwards, I would never speak to you except in the sound that you know, comes when people are secretly speaking to one another. إِلَّا السِّرَارْ أَوْ أَخَى السِّرَارْ Except I would, that I would, you know, uh, and the Prophet ﷺ wouldn't be able to hear Abu Bakr anymore. <laughs> so you would have to ask him again, what did you say? Because Abu Bakr was afraid that he would be raising his voice above the voice of the Prophet ﷺ. To, and also Abu Bakr, what he did is he took into his own hands the fact that every time a new person would come meet Rasulullah, he would take him first and he would teach him the adab of how to meet Rasulullah before he can go and meet Rasulullah. Then he would let him meet because a lot of people would come and they wouldn't know these sort of verses. And don't be so loud like the way you're loud to one another. Or another understanding of وَلَا تَجْهَرُوا لَهُ بِالْقَوْلِ is that don't say Ya Muhammad just like that. Rather give him the title Ya Rasulullah. Or Ya Nabi Allah. You notice that in the Quran, 6,000 and something verses. In the Quran, not once does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala address the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying Ya Muhammad. Everybody's flashing their memories now to see if they can prove me wrong. Um, but this is a reality. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't address the Prophet like this. And if he did, please tell me, but I don't think he did. But he did address other Prophets like that. And you're flashing your memory now, right? You're searching your memory for it. Does anybody have any other any examples? Wakunna ya Adam. We said to Adam, O oh Adam, Ya Dawood. Ya Ibrahim, Ya Musa. But when he came to the Prophet wasallam, the address is different. Rasulullah, the Messenger of Allah. Allah is teaching you the manners in how you should be treating your Prophet. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who's his Lord, he didn't address in that manner so that you can learn from him. Throughout the Qur'an, not once does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala address. Of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our Lord, all of our Lord. But He's trying to teach us a manner with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that when you're addressing Him, say Rasulullah, say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, وَلَا تَجْهَرُوا لَهُ بِالْقَوْلِ Don't say, Ya Muhammad. A lot of people used to just come and say, Ya Muhammad. Just like they would be, you know, talking to one another. Ya Muhammad. Nowadays, what happens when you go to some countries, they're like, Ya Muhammad. Ya Muhammad. Ya Muhammad, subhanAllah, and become so part and parcel of you that in certain countries, Ya Muhammad is actually a negative way of, con- of talking to people. Muhammad. وَشَقَّ لَهُ مِنْ إِسْمِهِ لِيُجِلَّهُ فَذُو الْأَرْشِ مَحْمُودٌ وَهَذَا مُحَمَّدٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took the name out of his own very name, Mahmud, so that he may raise him and elevate him in status. فَذُو الْعَرْشِ مَحْمُودٌ The one that's above the arsh, his throne, is Mahmud. And this is Muhammad It said that there was no one historically that had ever named himself Muhammad with the exception of Rasulullah wasallam. With another slight exception that right before prophethood of Rasulullah, because the Prophet wasallam is mentioned by name in the Hebrew text of the Bible, because he's mentioned by name, some of the people, they started, some of the people of the book, they started to recognize that it's around the time where this new prophet is gonna come, and his name is Muhammad. So some people started to name their sons Muhammad as well. As- aside from that, historically there was no one that was named Muhammad besides the Prophet. And what's gonna happen if you do this? Your deeds will go to waste. Do you want your deeds to go to waste? Nobody wants their deeds to go to waste, right? Let me ask you, who's went for Hajj over here? You been for Hajj? MashaAllah. Who's been for Hajj? You been for Hajj Umrah? 
Raise your hands high. Okay, some people. If you have ever been for Hajj or Umrah, you'll notice that you, um, you probably definitely went to the grave of the Prophet ﷺ as well in Al Masjid Al Nabawi. What happens when you go to Masjid Al Nabawi and you're walking by the grave? People are so loud, yelling at one another, pushing, shoving one another, especially in seasons where there's a lot of people, right? Everybody's shoving one another. There's a lot of hustle and bustle. And tahbata a'malukum. Lest your deeds may go to waste. This ruling is there before when the Prophet ﷺ was alive and it's there today. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, oh you believe, do not raise your voices before the Prophet ﷺ. And above the voice of the Prophet ﷺ. That ruling was there before and it's there today. That's why Umar ibn Khattab, some men, they started making noise around the grave of the Prophet ﷺ, after the Prophet ﷺ had passed away. And he said, by Allah, if you were the people of Medina, I would have beaten you guys. Umar is always ready to beat people. So he said, if I knew that you guys are not, you know, you guys are out of town, I know that. If you guys were from the people of Medina, I would have done something really bad to you. I would have beaten you. Why? Because he know, knew the people in Medina know the adab of being around the grave of Rasulullah. Not to be loud. You know what happens to people when they go to the graveyard? When they go to the graveyard, everybody's very quiet. Nobody says anything, right? We're all pondering the fact that there's a disease right before us. The greatest of humanity, or the greatest person who was ever deceased, you're standing before him and you're yelling, shouting, talking to one another, pushing the other person. This is what the adab is supposed to be? This is what it's supposed to be? I remember subhanAllah, this year, I was sitting around the grave of the Prophet ﷺ, earlier on this year, and it's like a cross from the grave. And I was reading a book. I was reading Sharh ibn al-Attar on Arba'in Nawiyah. I said to myself, I'm going to finish this book before I get up. So I sat there for maybe three or four hours, maybe more, five and believe you me, in all of Al-Masjid Al-Nabawi, that was the most difficult place to read. That was the most difficult place to read. But I said to myself, I'm, after this, I'm about to travel, I won't have time to finish the book, I'm gonna sit here until I finish. So I kept on reading it, and there was, it was so difficult, literally a fight broke out in front of me. In Al-Masjid Al-Nabawi. And lies. People... The person that was fighting, he was bothering somebody. When the security official came, he started telling him lies. So I had to intervene. I said, no, he's lying. I just saw him right now. He was the one who started the whole thing. He was the one who called him names. He was calling the person names. In the Al-Masjid Al-Nabawi, before the grave of Rasulullah where we are supposed to stay silent and quiet, the only thing you're supposed to say is, Assalamu alayka ya Rasulullah, and, and walk out. That's it. Or if you want to pray salah and... You know, uh, you want to be in the first saf, the only time you can do that is if you're in that area. That's the only place where the first saf is, right? The first row. So when you go to Al-Haram Al-Madani, when you go to Medina, make sure that when you're about to go and visit the grave of Rasulullah Wasallam, stay silent. Even if somebody's picking on you, even if someone pushes you, stay silent. Because the last thing you want is, أَن تَحْبَطَ أَعْمَالُكُمْ The last thing you want is to lose all of your deeds, all because you're bothering the Prophet ﷺ. Someone would say, he's dead anyways. How is he going to be bothered? The Prophet ﷺ, he is deceased, yes, we agree. But people in the graves, they hear. And this is a classical difference of opinion amongst the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And that's why when you go into, when you go into the graveyard, what do you say? Salama. Ya Ahl al Qubur. Assalamu alaikum. Kaf al Khatab, right? You address the Ahl al Qubur. That doesn't mean you call out to them, but what I'm trying to say is when you address, to, address people, do you address something that cannot hear you? What about the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ which says that the deceased hears the footsteps of the people that are walking away when they leave him? So the deceased can hear. They can hear. And hence, an individual is required to stay silent 
in all graveyards, and particularly along the grave of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. In the Ladina, yaghudun aswatahum and the Rasulillah. Those people who lower their voices when they're with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. أولئك الذين امتحن الله قلوبهم للتقوى لهم مغفرة وأجر كبير. Those people who lower their voices when they're before the Prophet ﷺ, when they're close to the Prophet ﷺ. Those are the people, these are the people whose hearts Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has tested. What does imtihana mean? What does imtihana mean? Somebody give me a definition of the word imtihan while I drink some water. Their hearts were tested. Okay, anybody else has, wants to try as well? They're definitely, imtihan means test, right? Challenge. Their hearts were challenged. How were their hearts challenged? Imtihan means to be te- to, to have a test, okay? So you say ikhtibar or you say imtihan. They're both words. When you're about to go into your exa- examinations, you say, you know, I'm in my ikhtibar or I'm in my imtihan. That's called a test. But literally what the word imtihan means is you say imtihan tul bi'ir. I tested the well. What does that mean? That means I went inside the well and I took all of the dirt and the mud out of the well. That's what that means. And you say a shayul mahan, something that is mahan. What does mahan mean? Something that is soft and laid out well. And you say imtihan to dhab. I took the gold and I tested it. That I'm just literally translating. What it actually means is I took the gold and I melted it. And after I melted it, if you know, there's different carats and golds, right? So there's 21, 24, uh, 14, less or more. Al-Muhim, when you melt it, what happens? It gets purified. The other chemicals that are attached, or the other metals that are attached for the gold to stay firm, so we can wear it or we can use it, right? For it to stay firm is now detached from it. It departs. It rises to the top. So this is what al-imtihan is. It means to purify. That's why if you look in the books of tafsir, when it says, أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ امْتَحَنَ اللَّهُ قُلُوبَهُمْ لِلتَّقْوَىٰ Those are the people whose hearts Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has tested. It doesn't say tested. It says, أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ صَفَّ اللَّهُ قُلُوبَهُمْ لِلتَّقْوَىٰ those are the people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purified their hearts. Just as when you go into the well and take out all the mud so that the water is nice and clean. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying when Allah is saying, I have tested. Those are the people whose hearts I've tested. Now, one of the unique things is, Allah says, Inna Those people who lower their volume, غَب means naqs, to lower, defect. So they decrease. They don't entirely, not even speak, but they decrease their volumes. Those who decrease their volumes when they're before the Messenger of Allah, and then He says again, those are the people. Again, why? Whenever an extra ism ishara comes, to simplify, oversimplify things, whenever an extra ism ishara comes, like ulaik, which means they, or those, or dalik, alif lam mim, dalik al kitab, that is the book, right? So whenever an extra one comes, and it's referring to a distance, not these, those. It is used in the Arabic language to, to elevate that object that is being discussed. So Allah to elevate them further, He doesn't just say, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَغُضُّونَ أَصْوَاتَهُمْ Those that lower their volumes are such and such. He says, those that lower their volumes, they are such and such. To sort of imply their greatness. Those are the people whose hearts Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has purified for the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be placed in there nicely. There's two things when you're dealing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Two main things that you need. 
there's bad deeds that you've done, right? كُلُّ بَنِي آدَمْ خَطَّى Every single child of Adam is a sinner. So there's bad deeds every single one of us has done. We all have dirty laundry in the back. We all have things in the closet that we don't want to share with people, right? We all have that. So there's two things when you're dealing with Allah. Number one, you have the bad deeds. You have your sins. You have that dirty laundry that you don't want to share with people. And number two, it's those good things which you're like so hopeful about. That when you go to Jannah or when you go meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you want to present and you want to hide everything else. Allah will know it all. But Allah says, if you're like this, then those are the people who Allah has purified their hearts for fear. And what's for them? لَهُمْ مَغْفِرَةً For them is forgiveness. So those bad deeds and the dirty laundry and the sins and all of those things that you didn't want to share with people, Allah takes care of those. Then, He says, the other thing in terms of those actions that you actually presented, وَأَجْرٌ عَظِيمٌ And very, very great reward. So every single thing that you have in terms of your interactions with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah is going to give you the best reward. But you have to remember, lower your volume. And what that means in our regard, is when we go to the haram, we lower our volumes, number one. Number two, when we are dealing with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the message and the legacy of Rasulullah, we realize and recognize that we're dealing with Rasulullah. So we lower our volumes. And the whole, it doesn't make sense, it's got to go out the door. But it doesn't make, but, but, this is what the hadith says, yeah, oh, yeah, oh brother. But no, it doesn't make sense to me. It, why doesn't it make sense to you? Allah's Prophet ﷺ, it made sense to him, and he was smarter than you, right? When we start adapting this methodology, we'll realize that the legacy of the Prophet ﷺ is more or less legacy for us as well. Whose nation are we? Prophet Muhammad's nation. A lot of people, times people are like, the Muhammadans, right? And, you have your odd person who says, Muhammadan, that's a problem. But I say that's not a problem, not at all. Why? Every single one of you, or most of you, that speak some Arabic, have used the word Muhammadan in Arabic, in your day-to-day -day conversations. Somebody give me an example of when you use the word Muhammadan in Arabic. Huh? Use the word Muhammadan in Arabic. Yes. No, no, not, not Muhammadan like that. I'm talking about Muhammadan in English. Muhammadan like uh, sometimes Orientalists, and a lot of Ori Orientalists pretty much started this whole um, attributing the Muslims to the Prophet ﷺ by saying Muhammadan. Anywho, I'll cut the chase. You'll notice that a lot of times while you're speaking, don't you say an Ummah al Muhammadiyah? A lot of us say that all of the time. We say an Ummah al Muhammadiyah, the perfect, the Muhammadan nation, not even the prophetic nation. An Ummah al Muhammadiyah, and it's used so frequently in classical works that it doesn't have any need for us to go ahead and talk so strangely of a lot of things like this. Subhanallah, we dwell on that are useless. That are useless. For example, the, when people address a certain methodology as Wahhabi, people have written entire books about this. What's the point? They said, why didn't they say Muhammadi? Why did they say Wahhabi? Whoever says this has a problem himself. Why? Because he doesn't understand the Arabic language. I'm not trying to legitimize the allegations, but I'm trying to say he doesn't understand the Arabic language. Because whenever a word is... Because the name of uh, Al-Imam was Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, right? Muhammad, the son of Abdul Wahhab. They say, why, why do they say Wahhabi? Why don't they say Muhammadi? Because in the Arabic language, the attribution goes to what? If the word is a compound word, it's made of, of numerous uh, different uh, parts. So there's Muhammad, there's Ibn, there's Abd, and there's Al-Wahhab. The, when it's like that, then the attribution always goes to the last part of the name. So my name is Abdul Wahhab. If you were to attribute something to me, you don't say Wahhabi. You don't say that. That makes no sense. You say Salimi because my last name is Salim. That's how you do it. 
So similarly, when they did that, they did that. Anyways, the allegations usually are inaccurate, but the point of the matter is that we don't need to stand up at every single thing and defend it like it's our religion. And Umman Muhammadiya, no problem. Muhammad, okay. What's the issue? What's the issue with that? We say Umman Muhammadiya all the time. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَغُضُّونَ أَصْوَاتَهُمْ عِنْدَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ امْتَحَنَ اللَّهُ قُلُوبَهُمْ لِلتَّقْوَىٰ Those are the people whose hearts have been purified for taqwa. طيب, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continued. And then He said, after I have given you the adab, let me give you a little story that it occurred. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُنَادُونَكَ Those that call out to you. Those that scream your name. يُنَادُونَكَ الحجرات, from behind your rooms and your houses. The Prophet ﷺ was married to numerous wives and hence he had numerous houses. But the houses were, I mean, if you were to have 10 wives, the house wouldn't even be up to here from the end of that room. So the houses were very, very small. They were just basically merely rooms, maybe a closet, something like the size of a closet because this is how the houses used to be during that day. And the Prophet ﷺ, he himself used to prefer asceticism. That was the preference of Rasulullah ﷺ. When uh, Jibreel came to the Prophet ﷺ and he asked him, would you want to be a, a king and a messenger or do you want to be a slave and a messenger? The Prophet ﷺ said, I want to be a slave and a messenger because slavery to Allah and servitude to Allah is where the reward lies. And that's why even when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls out to the Prophet ﷺ, in the best of situations, he calls him what? Subhana الذي asra bi abdihi. Glory be to the Lord who what? Who took during the night journey what? The Prophet وسلم, But he didn't say Rasul. He didn't say any of that. He said asra bi abdihi. He took his slave during that night, his servant during that night. And the Prophet وسلم, he said, "Ana Muhammad ibn Abdullah, Abdullahi wa Rasul. I am Muhammad, the son of Abdullah." The slave, he started off with slavery, servitude first. So the Prophet ﷺ, he preferred the life of asceticism. And of course, this is the preference that we should all adopt as well. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may Allah forgive us for, for our way. Miwara al hujurat. From behind the rooms, the little rooms of Rasulullah. People came and they wanted to discuss a matter with Rasulullah. So what did they do? They went and stood outside. And the Prophet ﷺ has a lot of things to do. At night time, he's with his Lord. He's praying, right? At, in the morning time, the Prophet ﷺ is addressing the problems of people. He wakes up in the morning, people have questions and answers. You see the Imam at the Masjid, the Prophet ﷺ is not an Imam. Nobody has the right to give fatwa during the time of Rasulullah ﷺ except the Prophet. So he's dealing with the situation and the problems of every single person during that time. If there's a hundred thousand people, the Prophet ﷺ deliberately chose to be on top of a mount when he was going for the last hajj so that people when they have questions, they can come and ask him. The Prophet ﷺ, you can imagine a hundred thousand people, everybody has questions. And there's only one mufti. Do you think he would have gotten any time to sleep during those days? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, of course not. So he has a lot of things to do. Beyond that, the Prophet Sallallahu is also discharging armies. The Prophet Sallallahu is dealing with delegations. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from his own household, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when a delegation comes, or even when captives come, the Prophet ﷺ brings the food for the captive from his own very house. The whole story of Thumamat ibn Uthad. He was... He was brought to the Prophet ﷺ captive from Yamama. The Sahaba, they were, they were scared. They, were, they thought that maybe there's gonna, you know, these people are trying to spy on us or something. So they saw Thumama somewhere in the desert, so they grabbed him. And they said, what are you doing? Alone. It looks like you're a spy. What are you doing? So they grabbed him. When they brought him before the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet took him to his masjid and placed him there. And then every single day, the Prophet ﷺ, you'd bring food for him from his own house. And he would treat him in a manner that was so amazing that within three days, Thumama said to the Prophet ﷺ, when I first came, I used to hate you and there was no one more hated to me than you yourself. But now I love you and there's no more, no more beloved to me than you yourself. 
So the Prophet has a lot of things to do, but even then, these people, they come and they don't understand how to deal with the Prophet He's within his house, now he has some time that he needs to give his wives as well. Ya Muhammad, oh Muhammad, oh this, oh that. So Allah says, those that are calling out to you, listen, oh Muhammad, those that are calling out to you, أَكْثَرُهُمْ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ They don't have any brains. Most of them, they have no intellect. Most of them, they have a problem in their brain. Most of them don't have intellect. وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ صَبَرُوا And if only they were to be patient. If they knew how the Prophet ﷺ was, and they saw how he lived, and how he treated his guests, how he treated the delegations, how he treated men, how he treated women, how he treated children, Rasulullah. If they knew how he was, then they would have been patient. Allah says, if only they were patient, وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ صَبَرُوا حَتَّى تَخْرُجَ إِلَيْهِمْ لَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُمْ If they only were to be patient until you yourself decide to come outside, because you're going to come outside eventually. This whole thing about eight hours for the family, eight hours for your sleep, and eight hours for work, this is nonsensical. A lot of times people, um, you know, in family counseling, um, even Muslims, they say, no, but he has to give me eight hours as well. And she has to give me eight hours as well. The Prophet ﷺ didn't give eight hours to any of his wives. None of them. There's no way. He didn't have that sort of time. And the wives were so busy themselves that they didn't have time. They were worshipping Allah Azza wa as well. And of course, they had a lot of other things to do. They, don't have this, they didn't have the same sort of facilities that we have today, right? They didn't have a dishwasher. If there was a dish, they needed to go find the water first and then wash it. So that took a lot of their day anyways. So the point is this whole eight hours scheme doesn't necessarily work if we were to apply it in the life of the Prophet To tell you the truth, if you look at his life, it would be hard to even imagine that he had an hour or maybe more than that for his family. Because he had so many different tasks that he was committing. He was uh, undertaking. And that's why when it comes to interactions, what we have been created for is the worship of Allah. So all of us, our indulgence should be in that. And aside from that, then we can interact with one another as well, and there's no problem. The Prophet ﷺ, Sunnah treats us you know, pretty kindly in this regard as well. But not as kindly as we wish. Because if we're asking our rights as husbands, and if we're asking our rights as wives, then let's look at the life of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet did this. That night he went out with Aisha on a stroll. طيب. يا أخ, يا أخ. The Prophet ﷺ went out on a stroll. It's only one narration. The Prophet ﷺ was up every single night praying. What happened to that? Now, of course, it, that doesn't mean the person that's sleeping all night, he says, you know what? The Prophet ﷺ only went out for a stroll once with his wife, so I'm gonna go out with my friends once in a year. I'll have a stroll with my wife as well. Remember, that if he wasn't going on a stroll, he was praying salah. He was doing something for the deen of Allah Azza wa So we have to balance ourselves in this regard. لا إفراط ولا تفريط We don't have to be extremist in either regards. We give our rights to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and foremost. After we've done that, we give our rights to the families as well. وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ صَبَرُوا حَتَّى تَخْرُجَ إِلَيْهِمْ If they were only to be patient until the point that you yourself would come out, it would have been better for them. Why would it have been better for them if they were just patient? Does anybody know? Of course, yeah. So sometimes you don't necessarily know the situation and patients will be able to explain to you further as you go down the lane of patience what exactly is happening and why you should have been patient. So that is definitely a fact. But aside from that, the reason is because the Prophet ﷺ, anything they wanted, he would have given to them. So long as they, they were patient. How do we know that? A poet says about the Prophet ﷺ, he said, مَا قَالَ لَا قَطُّ إِلَّا فِي تَشَهُودِهِ 
The Prophet وسلم, he never said la except when it came to tashahud. Of course, this is some this is sort of mubalagha, um, but you know, uh, this sort of extreme statement and exaggeration is used in poetry. Okay? It's understood, of course, the Prophet said, La tahasadu, la tabagadu. He said a, a lot of times, but generally if he was to be asked and requested of something, so long as the Prophet had, had that something that he was being requested about, he would say, okay, take it, no problem. So if these people, the Bedouins that came and they started screaming the Prophet's name at the top of their lungs, had they only been patient and waited, they would have realized that as soon as he comes out, if he has what they want, he would have given it to them. A man came to the Prophet ﷺ, he wanted to test them out sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He said, I want, you know, he basically wanted all of the livestock within one mountain and another. So what do you think the Prophet ﷺ did? He said, take it. He said, take it. So the man went back to his people and he said that, he started calling them to Islam, he said, accept Islam, فَإِنَّ مُحَمَّدًا because Muhammad gives in a manner of an individual that is not afraid of poverty. He gives and he gives and he gives. And that's why subhanAllah, sometimes if you've ever noticed, um, when people accept Islam, maybe you've noticed in a lecture if you've ever attended where people accept Islam, the shaykh will say, um, let's do fundraising for the person who's accepted Islam, right? Why are they doing that? That is to bring them closer to Islam and make them realize we love you so much. We understand you're just about to tread on a journey that's going to have a lot of hardships for you. Here's a little bit of help, a token of my appreciation. So this man that came with a weak Islam or no Islam to the Prophet ﷺ and he asked him what he asked him, he said, take it all. From one, li- from one mountain to another. All of that livestock, the Prophet ﷺ gave it up to him. But what did that do for the Prophet in return? This person became a da'iyah. He went back to his people, started calling them to Islam. So had they only been patient, لَكَانَ خَيْرُ اللَّهُمْ And the Prophet ﷺ would have given them whatever they really wanted. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا O who you believe. إِنْ جَاءَكُمْ فَاسِقٌ بِنَبَئٍ فَتَبَيَّنُوا O who you believe, when an evildoer comes to you, then make sure. Look carefully into the situation. Excess or check the situation. And see whether what he's saying to you is really true or not. So Allah is saying, whenever an evildoer comes to you, what's an evildoer? Fasiq? Does anybody know what fasiq is? Someone that gives you mental, physical, or spiritual harm. It doesn't necessarily have to give somebody else harm. Exactly. So generally speaking, it means a person who's a deviant from the right path. That's a fasiq. So there's someone called a kafir, and then after that, Someone that's not a kafir yet, not a non-Muslim, he's a fasiq. He's a person who is deviated from the right path. Usually it's referred to uh, for an individual who does evil deeds which are considered major sins. Usually it's referred to like that. Even if he's a Muslim, yes. Fasiq includes a Muslim and a non-Muslim. All of, everyone can be a fasiq so long as... And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes refers to non-Muslims in the Qur'an as fasiq and sometimes he refers to Muslims. In the Quran as fasiq. And of course, the one that is being referred to over here is actually a sahabi. Is actually a sahabi. So what I'm trying to say is that when Allah says fasiq, okay? When Allah says fasiq, when a fasiq comes to you, then check the news that he's bringing to you. It doesn't necessarily have to be a fasiq in a sense that in the apparent look of him, He's a fasiq. Apparently he may have a big beard, she may have a niqab. But deep down inside, or other actions suggest that he's a fasiq. Deep down inside we can't really test. But there's other actions, for example a person that does ghibah all the time. A person that does namima all the time. He's backbiting, slandering people. This is a major sin. A person that is known always forever to be jealous of people. 
This is a major sin. How do you know of a person who's jealous of people? Well, if people can become popular for Ain. Okay, people can become popular for Ain. Of course, we shouldn't speculate and say, this guy every time I meet him, something bad happens to me and stuff like that. But if it becomes so known in the community that this person, subhanAllah, he's really known for Ain, then there's actual ahkam rulings in the sharia of Allah Azza wa for such an individual. Because sometimes, yes, an individual can become really popular for this sort of thing. So, if you know a person that's really jealous of people, you know a person that's backbiting people, cursing people, you know, slandering people, different things like that, so you can now sense from this person's conversation, or he's doing a clear bad deed. Like for example, he or she is drinking, or fornicating, all of these things are bad, major sins, which lead a person to fisk. So if a person is a fasiq, the sin can be very small in the eyes of people, but it can be very major in the eyes of Allah Azza wa Jal, then make sure the news that He's giving you is correct. Linguistically, the word fasiq comes from the word fasaqa. And you say fasaqa rutab. A rutab is a date. Dates are of different types. And they go through different stages. Date in the beginning is called tal'a. Tal'uha ka'annaha ka'annahu ru'usu shayateen. In the beginning, it's called tal. It's still on the tree. Then after that, it's known as busr. There's a few stages in the middle. I'm skipping, cutting the chase. Then it goes into the stage of rutab, yataratab. Then it goes into the next stage, which is called tamar, yatatamar. So, fasaq rutab means when you have that nice, juicy, flavorful taste. Okay. Tasty date. You know, everybody knows what rutab is? The date that's nice and juicy. It has a lot of juice in it. You just want to eat it. Anybody has one? If anybody has one, bring it to me. So this is what a rutab is. Okay? It's that nice, juicy date. But fasaq rutab means kharaja min qishrihi. That it came out of the covering of the date. That layer that covers the date when the rutab, it begins to become really dry. And because of the dry and hot weather in certain countries, that rutab date, sometimes you'll notice the juicy stuff comes out and the, and the covering of the date is in your other hand. Oh, jazakallah khair. MashaAllah, this is... Okay, so maybe we can also demonstrate here. No, I'm just, I'll eat it afterwards, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Tayyip. So, when the juicy stuff comes out and the covering is now parted, this is what they call fasaq al-rutab. Okay? Fasaq al-rutab. So, how does that relate to the word that we're referring to over here? Fasaq. It relates to the word because when a person starts to commit these deeds and these evil deeds, essentially, he's known as a believer, right? And that belief is like a layer around him. It's like that layer on top of the date. It's a layer covering him and protecting him from every direction. But when he starts to commit these deeds, then he's out of that layer. And that protection that was there is no longer there. And what happens to that very date, when it comes out of its coverings, we all know all sorts of bad things can happen to the date, right? At times little things trickle into the date, and times things grow on the date. A lot of things, then we have to throw the date out. Similarly, the individual, when he comes out of, he becomes a fasiq, he comes out of that layering of iman, then you'll notice that he will slowly trickle down that path of evil, one thing after another, leading to, وَالْعِيَادُ billah, Maybe even possibly disbelief. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا O who you believe, in جَاءَكُمْ fasiqun. Whenever a fasiq comes to you, whenever an evildoer comes to you, بِنَبَى With the news, فَتَبَيَّنُوا Then make sure of that news. Why should you make sure أن تصيبوا قوما بجهالة فتصبحوا على ما فعلتم نادمين So that you don't end up harming a people in ignorance, then you will be very very sorry at what you have done. And this is a major problem that is starting to occur in our societies. And it occurred even then. The story behind this verse is that Al-Walid ibn Uqbah ibn Abi Mu'ayyid, he was 
set by the Prophet ﷺ to go and gather some zakat from Bani Mustaliq. So when the Prophet ﷺ had sent this man to go and gather some zakat from Bani Mustaliq, he started walking towards them, but before he'd accepted Islam, prior, long time ago, Walid, when, before he'd accepted Islam, maybe a few years ago, he had a problem between his tribe and the tribe of Bani Mustaliq. So when he started walking towards Bani Mustaliq, Bani Mustaliq was so happy to give their zakat to the Prophet ﷺ. Dear poor dude, this man, what did he think? He said, oh, that big problem that occurred between us, they're coming to get me for that now. So he said, okay, he turned back, he started running. So they started running after him even stronger. <laughs> so he started being even more sure of the fact that these people are gonna kill me, they're gonna do something to me. Anyways, he was able to escape, or so he thought. So he went to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, where is the zakat? They haven't given us the zakat yet. It hasn't went to the Bayt al-Mal yet. It hasn't went to the uh, you know, finance house of ours. It didn't go there yet. So he said, you know, they mana'uni zakat. They didn't give it to me, O Prophet of Allah wasallam." So what did he do? He lied. He made a lie. He said a lie. Before the Prophet ﷺ, he made a lie. It was a mistake. Of course, when we're talking about the Prophet ﷺ, we say he's ma'asum, he's infallible, he doesn't commit sins, not major, not minor, all of those things. But when it comes to the Sahaba, they commit sins, they're human beings. They have that virtue of the fact that they were companions, but they commit sins just like all of us. And if they hadn't commit sins, maybe we would have said to ourselves, hey, they're different, very, very different from us. There's no way you can oblige us to do what they used to do. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it so they commit sins. So that you're able to understand that though they committed sins, but they were able to still implement the vast majority of the sharia, ah, just as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had prescribed it. And you can do it as well, because you're human beings just like they were. So he said to the Prophet ﷺ what he said. A little while later, the Banu Mustaliq tribe also came. And they said that, O Prophet of Allah, we thought that you had sent someone for zakat to gather the zakat from us, our poor you. And you wanted to give it to him, but before we could give it to him, he started to leave. So we thought that you had written a letter to him to leave, so that for whatever reason, because you're mad at us, or whatever the case may be, they said, we don't want the anger and the wrath of Allah and His Messenger. That's what they told the Prophet so the Prophet ﷺ looked at Al-Walid and he wasn't too happy and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala re revealed at this point, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, O who you believe, in ja'akum fasiqun, if a fasiq comes to you. And that's why I said, don't necessarily get fooled by the outlook. Some people will say, oh he's a mutawwa, he's got a beard, he's doing good, he's, she's, you know, she was yeah, five times a day. There's no way she could be lying to me, she could be lying, he could be lying. You still got to be careful. No, he's not a fasiq. Fisk is not just what you think. That he has to commit zina, and he has to be drinking alcohol, and he has to be partying at night, and she has to be doing this. And that, that's not necessarily fisk. Fisk can be bigger than that. It can encompass a lot more people than we imagine. And the other thing is that I would suggest that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, though He said, Oh, who you believe, if a fasiq comes to you, then confirm the news. Though he said that, I don't think that's entirely meant. And I say this because somebody will say, لا تقدموا بين يدي الله ورسوله. I'm not doing that. Because in the Quran, numerous times, does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say something, okay? But as they say, خرج مخرج الغالب. It ended up being considered with that statement, with that attribute, with that qualification, just because normally the situation is as such. Normally, where you really have to check, it's gonna be a fasiq. Normally that's the case. But at times you may have a person that's generally pious, but he may be saying something to you that is not accurate. So the hukum, the ruling, it should be attached to the fact that whenever you are in the slightest of doubt, whether it be because of his fisk, whether it be because of his malicious behavior, or it be because of any other surrounding reasons you have to make sure. Let me give an example of that. 
Everybody knows Al-Imam Al-Bukhari, right? Any of you think Imam Al-Bukhari had messed up Aqeedah? Nobody was accused. طيب. How about Imam Al-Shafi'i? Any of you would suggest that Imam Al-Shafi'i had messed up Aqeedah? I'm particularly referring to Aqeedah because nowadays we have these sects and they're always accusing one another of Aqeedah problems. Any of you can suggest to me that Imam Al-Shafi'i had Aqeedah issues? طيب. Imam Al-Tabari. Any of you can tell me Imam Al-Tabari had Aqeedah issues? طيب. خير. How about and how about and I'll list the name, names endless. Imam al-Bukhari was accused of having aqidah issues, belief issues, during his time by one of his peers. And that problem took Imam al-Bukhari's 20,000 students away. He used to have a halaqah of about 20,000 people. Because the halaqah was so big, people started becoming jealous of him. People started becoming jealous of him. The issue that he spoke about, that issue is considered modern day aqidah of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And this is what all of you believe whether you know it or not. I'm not going to discuss the issue, there's no point. But the point of the matter is at that time, though the other people that were also discussing the issue with Imam al-Bukhari, they're all Sunnis as well. But that jealousy led to that problem. So the point that I'm trying to get to over here is it's not necessarily only a fasiq i.e. an apparently fasiq individual. It means any person that can have doubts in what he's saying because of the circumstances and everything that is within the circumstances, you have to put it away. You have to put that news away. Or put it to the litmus test, go and check. Imam al-Nasa'i was literally trampled, okay? Was stomped in his testicles. Sorry, the excuse me for the language. Through which he died. He was literally stomped in his testicles through which he died because of the fact that people suggested that he had aqidah issues. Imam al-Shafi'i was about to get death penalty because people suggested he had shihi aqidah. He was about to get death penalty until he finally met one of his friends who were studying with him at, uh, uh, at the madrasa of Imam Malik in Medina. What happened was Imam, Mal, Imam al-Shafi'i used to be in Mecca. Then he went to Medina to study for Malik. Then he went to Najran and he became kind of like the governor of Najran. When he became the governor of Najran, he wouldn't let anything go except that he would establish the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in it. Because he's the Imam. And he's, the, he's first he's a scholar, number two now he's the governor of the city. And he was there for five years. People, politicians in the locality, they started to get sick of it. So they started spreading rumors. He's from Quraysh. He sides with Ali. In kana rafdan hubu Ali Muhammadin falyashhad ithqalani anni rafdi. This is a line of poetry that Imam al-Shafi'i said when he was going, when he was now being dragged, chained to Baghdad, to Rashid, where they were going to look at look into the case of Imam al-Shafi'i and what happened. Why is he a rafdi and this and that? Why is he a Shi'i literally? So he said, if loving the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is considered raft, it's considered denial of Abu Bakr and Umar, then let everybody know that I'm a raft. And I love the family of, of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because he never, he never denied. He said, if that's what you call it, just the mere love, you want to call it raft, you want to call it Shiism, tell everybody I'm a Shi'i. And then when he got there, eventually Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani, the student of Imam Abu Hanifa, who was also at one point the student of Imam Malik, he was there and he saved the day because he knew, possibly speculated that Imam Muhammad ibn Hassan and al-Shafi'i may have met each other when they were in 
when they were in uh, the same school of Imam Malik. It's speculated. Anyways, Imam al-Shafi'i was popular as well, and Muhammad ibn Hassan was popular as well. So at the gathering of Rashid, they got to know one another, and Muhammad said, look, I know this guy. He's a person of knowledge, he's not going to be doing these sort of things. The point of the matter is that I'm tr what I'm trying to get to here is don't get engulfed in this business of fulan is a bid'i, fulan is a fasiq, fulan is this, fulan is that. When someone comes to you, you're in front of two different situations. If someone brings you a news, you're in front of one of two different situations. That person who that information is being said about, either you're gonna have a bad dhan, a bad thought towards that individual, or you're gonna have a bad, thoughts toward, bad thought towards the individual who's bringing you the story. So you make that choice. Or you put the case away altogether, or you take the case and put it to the litmus test. Go ahead and ask him. Say, I got this news about you, is it true? No? Yes? Please tell me. Otherwise, don't indulge in this, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us, taught us this in the surah. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, in ja'akum fasiqun, binaba'in fatabayyanu. An tusibu qawman bi jahala, fatusbihu ala ma fa'altum nadimeen. Allah continues, but before we continue, I was thinking we should take a small break, and if anybody has any questions, we'll address those questions, and inshallah we'll continue. Uh, in a little while. What time is Salah? Okay, let's continue. Let's continue. We'll have the question answers, inshallah, before the next session after Salah, inshallah. وَأَعْلَمُوا And know أَنَّ فِيكُمْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ أَنَّ فِيكُمْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ And know that within your ranks is the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam Allah is addressing who the sahaba and he's telling them know that within your ranks is the messenger of Allah the first thing he tells them is wa'lamu no we know that perceiving information can be described in the arabic language in numerous different ways right Ma'rifa, ilm, al-dhan, al-shak, al-waham. These are all different grades or all different levels of perceiving information, perception of information. The first and the strongest level is fa'ilmun, thumma dhannun, thumma shakku, wa akhiru hunna wahmun ya azizi. The first one is ilm. Ilm means knowing something 100%. Okay? So you have the possibility of knowing something at 100%. So Allah is saying, don't have any doubts in what I'm just about to say to you. Know it 100%. You have something else that is called dhan, which is from 51 to 99%. And you have something called shak, which is 50%. And then you have something called waham, which is 49 and under. The point is, Allah is saying, don't have any doubts in what I'm just about to tell you. أَنَّ فِيكُمْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ That within your ranks is the messenger of Allah. There, he's right before them, of course there's no doubt about that. Let's continue. What else are you not supposed to have doubted in? If he was to follow you and obey you in a lot of that which you wanted. What did they want from the Prophet Remember that story that I just gave you of Al-Walid ibn Uqba? The long story where Al-Walid was sent to Banu al-Mustaliq and then he came back running and People started chasing him. They came back to the Prophet ﷺ. All oh, the whole story we just spoke about. Okay? What they wanted from the Prophet ﷺ was when Walid ibn Uqba came to the Prophet ﷺ and he told them what he told him, they said, the Sahaba around the Prophet ﷺ, they started encouraging the Prophet ﷺ and saying that, Oh Prophet of Allah, you gotta take revenge. Take the sword out. Start fighting them. The Prophet ﷺ is like, hang on guys. Let's make sure. But before the Prophet ﷺ even tried to make sure, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this verse to him. And the people came to him. So then Allah tells them now, rebuking them and scolding them about what they were doing. They said, Don't Allah is saying, Don't pressure the Prophet. Within you, amongst your ranks, is the Messenger of Allah. If he was to only follow you, what would happen? You would have fell into a major problem. You would have been destroyed. 
If he was to follow you, you would have been in a tough situation. Why? Because then you would have committed a sin. Somebody came to you, brought news, you didn't check, and you acted on it. You would have been committing a sin. So we understand from this that if a person was to act on news without verification, then that is not appropriate. That is a sin. It's, we have, the onus is upon every single one of us. That whenever a news about another individual comes to you, a brother, a sister, it's the right of your brother. And if you were not to do it, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, La'anittum, then you would have been destroyed. You would have been in this tough situation. وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ حَبَّبَ إِلَيْكُمُ iman. But it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who made iman endeared to your hearts. He made it beloved to you. He's the one who made it seem all seemingly to you. Or seemly to you. Nice. He's the one who did that. But hold on. When you love something, all of us that have been through high school or something of that sort, we're gonna say, oh, you know, Fulan has a crush on Fulan. That person has a crush on that sister, and that sister has a crush on that brother. And a lot of that is just because of lust. That's all it is. What happens after a couple of months, the crush goes and it goes on to another person, and then a few months later, oh, I'm over that already. And there's another crush, and so on and so forth. It continues like that. This is what, what's hub. Right? So it comes and it goes. The heart. وَمَا سُمِّيَ الْإِنسَانُ إِلَّا لِنَسِهِ وَلَا الْقَلْبُ إِلَّا أَنَّهُ يَتَقَلَّبُ That the heart was, the man was never named a man except because he forgets a lot. It comes from the same, similar root word. And the heart was not named a heart except because it flips and flops. One day you love something, the other day you hate it. So since that is the case, Allah didn't stop at حَبَّبَ إِلَيْكُمُ iman Because that muhabba can go away really fast. That love can go away. That crush that happens in high school, it goes away. Nobody even thinks about that. Allah says, وَزَيَّنَهُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ He beautified it. He made it seemly in your hearts. Because when you end up loving something, and after you love something, that reason why you loved it remained and it always remained just as glamorous the, you know as the first time you saw that then that seemly nature of that object will remain beloved to you forever so allah didn't just make it beloved to them after he made it beloved he made it seemly he made it beautiful beautiful وحبب <laughs> He made it very beautiful in the hearts. And subhanAllah, the word heart is interesting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word heart. Because the word heart has two words in the Arabic language. Who knows the other word for heart? Fuad. Fuad. Qalb and Fuad. What does the word Fuad mean? The word Fuad means it comes from no. التفاؤد, التوقد, which means it can be ignited really fast. So it can spark. Allah can spark the light of love in your heart, but what can happen? Even if it takes the light, the spark is there, it may still flip and flop. That's why He said, وَزَيَّنَهُ He beautified it in your flipping and flopping heart. Not the heart that takes light and ignites. Look at another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about in Surah Al-Humaz, He says, نَارُ اللَّهِ الْمُقَدَى The fire of Allah that's been ignited. أَلَّتِي تَطَّلِعُ عَلَى الْأَفْئِدَةِ He didn't say, أَلَّتِي تَطَّلِعُ عَلَى الْقُلُوبِ The fire of Allah which has been ignited, that fire which goes and attacks the hearts, but the heart that ignites. So the fire is going to take right off. In how fire for the people that backbite and slander people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, they will have a fire which has been kindled. Muqada. That fire that's been kindled, it will attack not only their foreskin, not only the skin, uh, the first degree burn, not even the third degree burn, it will be a burn that will melt the skins. Their skins will melt off, and it won't even melt to a degree that, you know, um, there's no opening to the heart. It will melt entirely, so now there's an opening to the heart, and now that fire will be attacking that heart. And then Allah uses the word fu'ad to tell you that that 
heart, it's going to ignite really fast. It's going to take the fire. But over here, Allah says, قلوب, every single word. That's why they say, النظم Qurani. Who knows what the word نظم means? نظم means like a little necklace. Okay? A necklace in which you take a pearl, and then you place that pearl into that necklace, one after another. Do you notice how smoothly the pearls seem when you, when you look at it? A pearl necklace, it looks very smooth. Every, every single pearl is the same size. You know, it looks very, very nice. And very smooth. That's why they call the wordings of the Qur'an, النظم Qur'an. It's like that necklace that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed every single word in the Qur'an has a lot behind it. وَزَيَّنَهُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ وَكَرَّهَا And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it disliked to you. What did He make disliked? And He has made hateful to you unbelief. Number one, the first station. Inshallah, disbelief is hateful to all of us. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make, it, make us hate it more. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, مَنْ مَنَعَ لِلَّهِ وَأَعْطَى مَنْ أَحَبَّ لِلَّهِ وَأَبْغَضَ لِلَّهِ وَمَنَعَ لِلَّهِ وَأَعْطَى لِلَّهِ وَمَنَعَ لِلَّهِ فَقَدْ إِسْتَكْمَلَ الْإِيمَانِ Whoever loves for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he hates for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and at the same time he gives for the sake of Allah and he withholds for the sake of Allah. This is the person who his iman is complete. Let me show you how you can withhold for the sake of Allah. You have a son very dear to you. Very, very dear to you. And you know for a fact that if you were to put a credit card in his hand, he's gonna have a very easy time buying whatever he wants. And it's nice to see, you know, your offspring, and they're, they're doing whatever they want, and it's, they, have, they have it easy, the life is easy. What did Ibrahim do? He made dua for his offspring, so that their life is easy. Right? And hence we have a lot of things in Mecca and Medina to take home with us. So he made dua for them for that. Everybody wants to see their children prosper in their lives. So you see your child and you're like, let me give you that credit card so you can do whatever you want. But hold on, if you know your child is going to be doing something haram, then, and you still continue to give him that card, then you're doing something that your iman is not complete because of. Take away the card. If it's the car that's ruining your child, take it away from him. If it's the money that you give every single day and you know he's buying drugs with it, take it away from him. Don't say, oh, everybody, he's, he'll tell you every parent gives money to their children, blah and blah and blah. No. مَنْ مَنَعَ لِلَّهِ أَيْضًا Whoever withholds for the sake of Allah as well. وَاعْلَمُوا وَكَرَّهَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْكُفْرُ And he made kufr, disbelief, hated towards you. وَالْفُسُوقُ And also transgression. And malice. He made it very, very, you know, hateful to you. you. You don't like it. But that's the second station. Now we're out of the disbelief. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking now about major sins. So the first thing is disbelief. That's a sin that takes you out of the fold of Islam. If you've actually entered to begin with. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts talking about fusuq. Which is the second station. And that is the station of major sins. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also made that thing or those things hated towards you, hated to you. And wal usyan and al usyan over here is referring to minor sins. So you have three different stations. The greatest of hatred towards anything is that you don't like the major sins, you don't like the minor sins, you don't like any disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whenever any disobedience of Allah is occurring, you don't like it. And you know it's very hard. A lot of us will say, yes, we hate disbelief, we hate major sins, we hate minor sins. Let me give you an example of a minor sin that you just can't hate. That you just can't hate. We're talking about hating now. When a person passes gas in public, what happens? What happens? People start laughing. Did everybody know that laughing at a person that's passing gas is a minor sin? You're laughing at what I'm saying. Oh, I know. That's what I'm trying to say. This is the thing. And the thing is, even if it occurs 
people that are the onlookers, they'll start giggling. They may be able to hold themselves, but they're, they're not going to hate the fact that the guy's lying. They'll be like, it's very understandable. So for you to complete and perfect your iman, every single thing that is in the slightest disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it just cannot be something that you smile at. You have to hate it. You have to hate it. That's the completion of iman. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought it in different stages. Some people just hate the kufr. It's a stage of iman. Another person, when he sees major sins, he's not going to like it. Some major sins, he may like them. Others, he's not going to like. Another person is a person that anything that goes against the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no matter how small, no matter how big, it's hated towards him. And this is the completeness and the perfection of iman. Ula'ika humur rashidun. These are the people that our followers of the right way and we'll stop here wa sallallahu ala sayyidina muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in